Welcome. Thank you for joining the World Affairs Council of Connecticut today to discuss combating international human trafficking with special guest Heather Fisher. Heather is a senior advisor for human trafficking in the philanthropy sector, who most recently served as the first ever White House special advisor for human trafficking. Heather, welcome and thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, Amanda. I'm so glad to be here. My name is Amanda Jolly, VP of, the, of Programs with the World Affairs Council. So today's structure will kick off with a conversation with Heather Fisher and Megan Torrey, CEO of the World Affairs Council. We're honored to have Heather here today to discuss the extent of the problem of international human trafficking and how we can help end trafficking around the world. Uh, so let's get started. I'm pleased to turn it over to you, Megan. Megan Torrey, CEO of the World Affairs Council. Thank you so much, Amanda, and welcome everybody today. And welcome again, Heather. We are so happy that you're joining us on State of the World. We've got a lot to talk about today because this is such a critical and important issue. So I just want to dive right in. So the issue of human trafficking is an urgent one, one that impacts so many um, vulnerable people around the world. And just so as we begin, we're all on the same page. Um, can you tell us you know, what your definition of human trafficking is? What are some of the most common forms? forms of human trafficking or shapes that it takes and how widespread is uh, human trafficking globally? Absolutely. Thank you, Megan. I'm just delighted to speak with you and the World Affairs Council audience again today. It's been way too long. As you know, human trafficking is perhaps one of the most pressing human rights issue of our time. The prevalence of human trafficking is not fully understood, unfortunately. However, the International Labor Organization does estimate that there are roughly uh, 24.9 million people currently living in modern slavery. To your question about what are the most common forms, uh, historically we talk about sex trafficking, which is the exploitation of a person for commercial sex through means of force, fraud, or coercion, and is perhaps the most talked about form of human trafficking. But labor trafficking, including forced labor, is also a common form of exploitation. For example, we commonly see labor trafficking in the following sectors globally in factory work and agriculture, nail salons, fishing industry, mining and domestic servitude. And in terms of the scope of the problem, according to some of our best estimates, human trafficking is roughly $150 billion industry, second only to drug trafficking. And again, the International Labor Organization estimates that 9 billion in profits stem from commercial sexual exploitation, 51 billion from forced labor, including domestic work, agriculture, and other economic activities. So the scope of human trafficking is huge. In your work, do you find that um, there is a lack of awareness of the scope of human trafficking? And why is this issue not as visible as it, as it you know, perhaps should be? Yeah, I agree. People are sometimes surprised to hear how pervasive and widespread the issue is. I certainly was when I first learned about um, the issue of human trafficking. 20 years ago. I find that average layperson or citizen is now familiar with the term human trafficking, but they really struggle to understand what human trafficking is. Human trafficking is not synonymous with human smuggling, but the two issues are sometimes conflated. And it's my experience that people are shocked to hear that human trafficking is not just an overseas problem, though it is. There are human beings who are born and raised right here in our communities that are being exploited through forced fraud or coercion for something of value. Absolutely. And as we sit here in Connecticut, we know it's, it's, it's a big issue right here in our backyard. You mentioned that, you know, human trafficking is far more than um, sex work. And it really um, also encompasses forced labor and modern day slavery. When we're looking worldwide, where do you see some of the hot spots of forced labor? Forced labor is really being addressed in a number of locations across the world right now. But over the past year, the U.S. government has paid particular interest to goods produced by forced labor in China. You may have seen some of the recent actions and activities. Um, perhaps uh, the reporting regarding ethnic Muslim Uyghurs, ethnic Kazakhs, and other minorities that are being imprisoned and forced to work in factories um, producing cotton textiles and other goods. The U.S. State Department recently declared that the humanitarian crisis meets the criteria of a genocide, which is very serious. Um, and there's certain steps that the U.S. government has taken to ensure that the goods produced by forced labor don't enter, enter into our supply chain. Let's talk about the U.S. role and what role the U.S. has to play in combating human trafficking globally. The first event that happened this past year, on July 1st, 2020, the U.S. State Department, alongside the U.S. Department of Treasury, U.S. Department of Commerce, and the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, 
issue the Xinjiang Supply Chain Business Advisory. This was simply an alert to businesses that they were potentially dealing with bad actors and that they were exposed to forced labor in the supply chain. And we asked them to consider their reputational um, engagement, the economic impacts and legal risks of involvement with entities that engage in human rights abuses in Xinjiang. In May of 2020, the Commerce Department added nine Chinese entities related to human rights abuses in Xinjiang um, to the entity list, which resulted in named parties to face new restrictions on access to US technology. And one further point that I'd like to make is that um, recent actions regarding CBP, US Customs Border Protection, um, to eliminate items made by forced labor from coming into the supply chain really serve to protect American consumers, including me and you, from unwittingly or unknowingly buying items that were in essence made by modern slaves. And I have to say, my hat goes off to these folks within uh, the agencies that I just named, including US Customs and Border Protection Trade Office, because they're offering support as quickly as possible to companies that need to remediate and get back online uh, so they can continue to produce their goods free of supply chain issue. Absolutely. Thank you, Heather. Having been the uh, presidential advisor on human trafficking, one thing that you um, definitely know about are the policy tools that the U.S. has um, to address human trafficking. Can you talk to us a little bit about what, poli what policy tools the U.S. has? Yeah, I'd be happy to. I think perhaps one of the best policy tools that the U.S. government has is the Annual Trafficking in Persons Report, or as we like to say shorthand, the TIP report. It's issued by the U.S. State Department and assesses every country, including the United States, their activities to prevent human trafficking, prosecute traffickers, and protect victims and survivors of human trafficking. The TIP report, as it's commonly referred to, is an important tool in diplomacy as well. It's a tool for our ambassadors to engage with embassies overseas and, and partner countries to talk specifically about the issue of human trafficking and what more we all could be doing to improve our activities. Absolutely. There is also the um, Trafficking Victims Protection Act. Um, can you talk about that? And has this been an uh, effective tool to combat trafficking? Yes, it has. And actually, 2020 marked 20 years since the passage of the Trafficking Victims Protection Act of 2000, otherwise known as the TVPA. And the TVPA was a landmark piece of bipartisan legislation that gave the United States the legal framework to take on human trafficking. And since then, we've accomplished a great deal. Uh, since the passage of the TVPA, but we have so much more to do in the next 20 years of anti-trafficking work to really mature and evolve our practice. And so myself and my other colleagues, we're really asking ourselves right now, as we reflect on 20 years of success, what more uh, can we be doing to really advance the trafficking work? How could we move the needle? And what is the next 10, 20 years of the anti-trafficking frontier in space look like? So Heather, another tool in the toolbox, um, a policy tool is uh, the Global Magnitsky Act. Um, so what tools does this act um, provide to sanction human traffickers? And have we seen any specific success stories? Yes, we have. It's an important tool. You're right. Most recently, in July of 2020, the U.S. Department of Treasury's Office of Foreign Assets Control, or OFAC, as we call it, sanctioned one Chinese government entity and two current and former government officials in connection with serious human rights abuses against ethnic minorities in the Xinjiang region. The entity and the officials were designated for their connection to the human rights abuses, um, including forced labor. And I think that really got the attention globally um, and held people to account in a, in a new fashion. And so I, I think there's there was a lot of buzz around that. And we are really grateful um, to be able to have a, a lot of different authorities and tools to be able to hold people to account. Absolutely. So um, for a second, I just want to pivot to talk about conspiracy theories, because conspiracy theories that have once sort of stayed on the fringe of society have, uh, you know, become further and further uh, mainstreamed in the discourse. So human trafficking, as we know, has been sort of the powerful um, part of the powerful movement movements, including Pizzagate and QAnon. Why do you think so many conspiracy theories have latched on to the issue of human trafficking? Um, and how, how do you highlight uh, the real needs of doing the, the hard work to combat human trafficking? 
Well, first of all, let me just say that conspiracy theories are harmful to our efforts to address human trafficking. Misinformation absolutely detracts from the very grim reality that we live among those who truly are being bought and sold like commodities. And conspiracy theories are wholly unproductive. And they create a narrative that the anti-trafficking field then has to demystify and to work against. So I would say some of the conspiracy theories have taken root because some of the more notable human trafficking rings that were uncovered that were utterly stunning. For example, the survivors who have bravely spoken out against Jeffrey Epstein and Keith Ranieri of Nexium have really illuminated that there is in fact a dark underworld of exploitation that does exist. And I think from there, um, some of these theories have taken wings, which is really unfortunate. But I think as the anti-trafficking field, we've really tried to stay focused on the known uh, activities and cases that we can we can point to and, and not continue to give um, conspiracy theories any extra uh, oxygen around it. From your perspective, how can those who work to combat human trafficking best communicate the issue with ethical storytelling that better illustrates the experience in reality of human trafficking? I learned this early on in my work that listening to the voice of survivors of human trafficking is really key. During some of my early work with Love 146, they saw firsthand how we talked about the issue or depicted the issue through communications directly impacted what signs of human trafficking the community or audience is looking for. For example, it's very rare that we learn a victim or survivor of human trafficking was actually kept in chains, handcuffs, or ropes. And yet we see those items depicted in imagery frequently. Using this type of imagery in our community education could potentially mean that we're asking citizens to look for victims and restraints when we know that victims are not tethered to their trafficker in that way. Victims are often under strict control, but the trafficker primarily uses fear, not constraints. Uh, also, we, we often see women and girls are most often talked about when we're depicting trafficking, but we know that anybody could be a victim of exploitation. So I especially appreciate those who are trying to raise awareness when they uh, don't just depict images of women and girls, but are inclusive of anybody who could potentially be a victim of human trafficking. And so professionals in the anti-trafficking space have learned that using provocative means to garner attention, number one, is not effective, and two, re-exploits a trafficking situation. And I'm really encouraged to see that for the most part, the way we tell stories has evolved and matured to an honest portrayal. And I think that's because we have listened to the voice of survivors who have said, this is not, the way that this is depicted was not my actual experience. And so we've shifted gears to, ha to have something that's more reflective of how we see trafficking take place. So uh, keeping on that on that note, um, you know, there are a lot of people who wanna know what individually they can do. And so we actually have two questions now, one from Cynthia and one from Nicole that I wanna sort of combine. So, you know, they wanna know what they can do to help fight human trafficking. Cynthia says, you know, are there any, signs, indicators that would alert someone that an individual is a victim of human trafficking. You know, many people have heard the incredible story of the flight attendant who suspected a young girl um, who was traveling with a man against, you know, against her will and turned him in. So what would you tell the people listening in the audience about what kind of impact they can have in some actions that they might be able to take? Yeah, I often hear that people want to take action, but they have two reactions. One is that it feels really overwhelming, that this is a really dark and paralyzing issue. Some people may feel, feel powerless, but wanna know how they can actually take action. And there's no doubt about it. This is a dark and paralyzing issue. It was overwhelming to me when I first heard and saw uh, what was happening in some dark corners of the world. But what I know is, is that survivors of human trafficking are incredibly resilient. When they're given access to the resources that they so deserve, and they need, and they go on to do amazing things. And the road for survivors post exploitation is by no means a fairy tale ending. Life is often up and down, just like it is for the rest of us. And we as a society and people must be thin skinned enough to care, to make an intervention, to make a difference. I think we need to do so safely. I, you know, some of our initial reactions um, or things that I've heard from other folks is, you know, I just want to stake out a corner in my community and, and watch for trafficking, or I want to kick down doors and, and take on traffickers. And, and that's really an, a human reaction, but probably not the most helpful, right? I think that we have to understand that 
just like any other form of abuse, if we come across something that is not sitting right with us, or we see somebody who is potentially being exploited, abused, they're not in possession of their documentation, they have fear um, of law enforcement because somebody's telling them that they are at risk of some type of law enforcement action, then I think those are the things that people can subtly pick up on and, and carefully engage and, and reach out to the National Human Trafficking Hotline and provide a tip um, to the clearinghouse there. But as we look to the forms of human trafficking um, and how they take place around the world, let's also address the people who are involved. What groups are especially vulnerable to becoming victims of human trafficking? How might people identify signs that someone could um, be a victim of human trafficking? And, and I'll just say that um, oftentimes we in here in the United States, we talk about women who have or um, who come from vulnerable communities, children who have faced poverty, housing insecurity, involvement in the child welfare system. All those things can put somebody at increased risk for exploitation and human trafficking. But I just want to stress that there's no one profile of a victim and anyone can find themselves in a potentially exploitive situation. Absolutely. So we have a question from Susan who has read that banning forced labor goods um, can mm -hmm. inadvertently have the effect of forcing those um, who are now, you know, children who are now out of work into sex work, into prostitution. Um, first, is this, you know, is, have you in, in your um, experience, is this the case? And if so, um, what sort of protections can you put in place to avoid those kinds of situations? I think this is where good governance comes into play. The point of remediation within forced labor and supply chains is not to put businesses out of commission. It is to ask them to pay back the fair wages or to modify the recruitment practices and get back online as quickly as possible. I think those are some of the ways in which um, governments can take action, but I, I think that there's more room to be done with the consumer. What I mean by that is, is that we have um, the great uh, power behind the American dollar. We as consumers can say that um, purchasing goods free of forced labor is something that's important to us. And I think the more that consumers reach out to companies and say, this is important to me and I'm willing to pay a little bit money, more money for this particular product to ensure that it's free of forced labor is something that anyone can do. Um, and I, I am convinced that if um, I myself am willing to pay you know, $7 for a pricey cup of coffee because it's direct trade, uh, then I think you know, people, if they, if they knew that they could spend a little bit more money and ensure that the goods were produced without forced labor, I, I think people would do it. And so I think we have a bit of a responsibility here as well in using our purchasing pow power to demand that um, companies it improve their practices. Excellent. Thanks, Heather. So we have a question from Ritika who uh, wants to know if, if in your experience, have you seen a link between child marriage and human trafficking um, and to what extent uh, child marriages may leave um, young people more vulnerable to become victims of human trafficking? So internationally, there are some that include forced marriage in the trafficking definition. Here in the United States, those are separate statutes. Um, and so, yes, there is somewhat of a linkage um, because that person is not in control of their own body and they are forced into um, the marriage situation. But historically here within the United States, we've not included that into our anti-trafficking focus. Um, certainly we do see incidences overseas where, um, where that is a more of a formalized network of, of traffickers who are facilitating forced marriage. Excellent. Thank you. So uh, a question from the audience. So you mentioned, you know, making good consumer choices. Uh, do you know of any resources that we can point the audience to, to recommend, um, you know, places to purchase, you know, fair trade goods? Yeah, there are a number of websites. Uh, Slavery Footprint is one that you can look to. I just saw recently that the OSCE globally um, has put out a resource list. So I'd be happy to follow up with a number of websites and resources that the audience can turn to so that they can check and see. Also, um, US Department of Labor has a report that they give every year on goods produced by forced labor. So I'll be sure to pass along those resources and links to you all so you can 
um, take a first hand look yourself. Excellent. Thank you so much, Heather. So, um, a lot of what we've done in state of the world over the last month has been sort of analyzing um, the new administration and, and what's going to happen and, you know, going forward. Um, you know, why or why not should uh, combating human trafficking uh, be a foreign policy priority for the U.S.? Uh, what do you think? First, I hope that the new administration does keep human trafficking as a top priority and really at the forefront of the work that they're doing. Not only is it one of the most pressing human rights issues of our time, but it, it also undermines our economy. We simply can't compete with countries who are producing goods by forced labor. And I think it also poses a very real national security threat. And I don't think any of us wanna see human traffickers operate with impunity on a national or global scale. I do think that there are a few immediate wins for the new administration I have some good news. I think first, I would encourage them to fill the White House human trafficking czar role. And I wouldn't do it just as a staffer. I would keep um, the position of the czar. I think it's really important for internal coordinating purposes with the executive office of the president, but also that person should continue to coordinate with the National Security Council to coordinate the federal interagency that sits on the president's interagency task force. And then uh, my posture always was just to have an open door. I can't remember a time where I ever refused a meeting, a phone call, Public-private partnership was really important to me. I always wanted to hear from external stakeholders. I was always looking for a way to engage with industry, with nonprofits, uh, with state and local governments and entities. And so I, I think that is my top recommendation that they uh, fill that role. I think it's critically important. And, and just to have that person in the midst of all the different meetings. I, I also sat in the Domestic Policy Council and was able to help inform some of the domestic policy by virtue of just being in those meetings and to be able to bring the human trafficking and child exploitation act, um, angle to the conversation as well. Secondly, um, I would say the new administration should continue to implement the new national action plan. It was developed among political and career professionals and really encourage them to continue to implement the whole of government approach to preventing and combating trafficking that is laid out in that new plan. Excellent. Thank you. So would you say that this issue um, may be one of those rare issues that would be uh, that could build bipartisan consensus? Yes. And this is perhaps the most important point I hope to make today. Historically, uh, human trafficking is absolutely is and should remain an apolitical issue that has bipartisan support. We simply couldn't have passed the Trafficking Victims Protection Act back in 2000. And all of our work, our efforts to date, I'm, I'm just very proud that this has been a bipartisan approach. I can't think of anyone who um, would say that this isn't a priority issue. And so I'm really hoping that moving forward in the next 20 years of the anti-trafficking space, we can continue to keep those um, lines of communication open and agree that this is um, such a travesty and such a pressing issue that it's gonna take all of us working together to really um, combat and dismantle human trafficking, both domestically and globally. Excellent. Thank you so much, Heather. As uh, as we end, I just want to ask you sort of what is what would your closing thoughts be to our audience today? Sort of what is your best hope for the future? I, I, I'm encouraged by you all. The fact that you are highlighting the issue of human trafficking, that you're kicking off your series talking about this gives me great hope. There were days in the early um, work of human trafficking where we just didn't have the, at the attention um, or the interest. And I'm so myself greatly encouraged that the World Affairs Council is talking about this issue, that you have people tuning in today. And so for me, that gives me bright hope for the future that, um, that this issue will continue to stay on the floor. And I'm just so grateful to you, Megan, and to the whole team for, for inviting me here today to speak with you all. Thank you so much, Heather. And we will definitely have you back. So I look forward to talking to you again. Thank you. Take care. And I'll just say thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, Heather, it's wonderful to see you. Thank you so much for sharing your leadership with us today. It was an important conversation. And I know I took away uh, so much. So thank you for being here. Um,
So for everyone joining us, thank you again for being a part of this discussion. Uh, this is an event of the Council's State of the World series. Uh, so coming up this season, we'll tackle everything from domestic terrorism to global movements for civil rights and from the Iran deal to China's new digital currency. Uh, so we invite you to join us next week when we'll speak with Dr. Trita Parsi on whether the U.S. should rejoin, reject, or renegotiate the Iran deal. Um, and to make sure that you don't miss an episode, uh, visit our website at ctwac.org, um, or you can subscribe to our YouTube channel at World Affairs Council of Connecticut, uh, or one of the podcast channels uh, from Google to Spotify to Apple Podcasts. Um, once again, thank you so much for joining us, and thank you, Heather, for sharing your leadership with us today. Until next time.